He was incredibly brave. Our daughters were very brave. I think our whole family was very brave because our lives changed so much. In 1976, the Sullivan started, and I think that must have been the peak of long hair for men. Now, what I figured then was if you had hair that short, you're either in the Sullivans, you're a policeman, or you're in the army. I guess luckily I was in the Sullivans. And in the Sullivans, Richard Morgan played the third and youngest Sullivan son, Terry. During the show's 800 episodes over seven years, audiences saw Terry grow from a scampish schoolboy in short pants at the outbreak of World War II to a prisoner of the Japanese in the infamous Changi death camp. In the years following the end of the Sullivans, Richard appeared in Neighbours, Blue Healers, Sons and Daughters, A Country Practice and MDA, before being cast in the recurring role of Reg the Ferret Masters in the undercover cop series Stingers. He filmed his last episode of that show in 2004, and a year later, tragically, he was diagnosed with motor neuro disease. I lived with two realities. I lived, I had a parallel universe going on. One, I had to have hope that Richard would be a miraculous survivor, that the disease would arrest in him. Um, I had to have hope for him to be able to support him on the journey. And I certainly had to have hope for my young daughters, our young daughters. The other reality was seeing his deterioration and seeing how rapid his onset was and how quickly he became disabled and then extremely disabled. It is of course a very difficult diagnosis to receive because at the moment motor neuron disease is incurable and it is a life limiting condition and, and no one wants to hear that they've been given. Um, something that's going to significantly curtail their lives. Um, perhaps from the doctor's point of view, it's difficult because it's a diagnosis that's um, so poorly known in the community generally. If I were to say to you that I think you have a form of cancer, you would all automatically understand roughly where I was going. And I think... Um, people understand what's likely to be ahead of them in that circumstance. If you say to a patient, you've, I think you've got motor neuron disease, then um, uh, mo most people may never have heard of the disease before. And so they don't automatically assume that this is a, di a difficult disease and that the rest of the conversation is going to be mm -hmm. quite difficult. We were shocked out of our wits because we had actually thought that Richard was or had been diagnosed with a disease that was treatable uh, and then to be given a life-threatening diagnosis, well a life, a terminal diagnosis. Uh, it was Friday afternoon of a long weekend, Richard drove home, I do not know how he did it, in peak hour traffic in the rain on a Friday night in Melbourne. Well we got home and we just looked at each other in disbelief. The adrenaline was, uh, I've never experienced adrenaline like that. Um, it, it was impossible to comprehend. Different people respond to a diagnosis like this in different ways from a psychological or an emotional point of view. Um, we all have our own ways of coping with it, that sort of that sort of news. Uh, and un undoubtedly there are some people who really don't even want to walk through the door the first time. Um, and there'll be occasional people who would find it very confronting when they do come here and perhaps see other patients with the same condition or similar conditions. The neurologist said, look, I'm sorry, uh, you've actually got motor neuron disease. And Richard had Googled it beforehand and he knew what it was and he said, how long have I got? And he started backing away towards a window, you know, with that fight or flight mechanism was just instinctive, I think, and he was trying to get away from the diagnosis. And the neurologist said, one good year, maybe three at the most. 
And that was so shocking to hear that. Basically, it's a disease that affects the nerve cells that communicate messages from your brain to your muscles. Those cells are called motor neurons. That's why the disease gets its name. Your capacity to think, your capacity to understand what people are saying, that, that's not diminished at all. What, what, what is diminished is your, your ability to use muscles. The definitive thing, however, is that the symptoms that you initially start off with, although relatively mild, the severity of those symptoms will progress uh, and they'll progress inevitably to a point where you can no longer uh, walk, you can no longer breathe, you can no longer swallow. In the last week of his life, he didn't want to know uh, that he was dying. He knew he was dying. He knew that it was rushing full speed. He had um, probably the tiniest little bit of movement in one finger. His brain was intact for most of the time and he could speak with his nasal tubes in. Uh, he was on a BiPAP most of the time, uh, but he was totally uh, without. He was not able to do anything. And the way his body, his body was breaking down in that last week. And it was very evident to me. Despite having come to terms with the awful truth that he would not see his and Lisa's little girls grow up nor be there on their wedding days, Richard remained incredibly positive that one day a cure would be found for this insidious disease. Another victim who in recent months has done much to create a greater public awareness of MND is former Essendon footballer Neil Danaher. What makes you so positive? What makes you sound so positive about this? I mean, hope is obviously a, a, a key word in your lexicon, isn't it? Well, uh, the opposite of hope is hopelessness. And um, where does that get you? The disease at the moment leads to hopelessness in the sense there's no cure, no treatment. But that's been the case over centuries where diseases have been terminal, no cure. We will find a treatment cure for MD. Um, it will happen. What I'm trying to do is um, represent MND sufferers, represent those that will be diagnosed in the future, and maybe allow them, when they're diagnosed, they're not given a, a hopeless scenario, there will be something in place to give them hope. I think Neil Danaher and the Cure for MND Foundation has done a fabulous job in raising recognition of this disease. And I see that as different from awareness. Recognition is when someone says, oh, have you heard about MND? And the person responding says, that's not a very good thing. Awareness is when you can actually understand what the disease does, even in simplistic terms. Oh, yes, it affects the motor neurons or, oh yes, it takes away your ability to walk, to talk, to breathe and to swallow. The role that needs to come is to help awareness grow so that we make sure that no one out there living with motor neuron disease doesn't know where to go to get help, that there are people like the MND Association who are delivering services, helping people live better for longer. People now have a a, a bit better awareness because it's been much better publicised um, within the general community. But I think until you've really known someone go through the disease, you probably don't fully appreciate the difficulties it causes a person um, to, to lose their independence and, and you know, potentially to lose speech and all the things that we just take for granted. MND is a, is a terrible disease for any family to have to go through. It impacts the, the obviously the person with motor neuron disease, but it really has a, a huge impact on families, you know, the, the partner, the brothers and sisters, the children. So we run other programs. And these are facilitated programs, but there are people who have already gone through that themselves who are there to help and to, you know, let people know that it's all right to, to move on with their lives. We never did say why us, uh, because things happen to people and that's life. Um, what we did say was, how sad, how sad for our children, how sad for us 
as a couple because we loved each other very, very much. We had a very strong connection and I still do. He still uh, supports me and comes to me and sees me and visits me. But we never said, why us? Uh, because we never, it just didn't come into it. Can you tell us something about the therapy development work that you're doing? My colleagues and I, we started testing a particular compound because we had reason to believe it may be effective for motor neuron disease. And we started testing that compound in animals that get the symptoms of the disease, uh, mice specifically. And from day one when we started the testing the compound, uh, it was generating very positive outcomes. It was improving the symptoms of the, the motor neuron disease-like symptoms in the mice. We're trying to basically develop the information that could support taking this particular compound into clinical testing. Whilst, as you've already told us, Doctor, the, the average life expectancy of somebody suffering from motor neuron disease varies between, say, two and, and five years. Um, the two patients, of course, uh, who have defied that prediction um, are Professor Stephen Hawking, the, the most celebrated of the two, I suppose, and the author of a book called Silent Body, Vibrant Mind, Peter Anderson. Have those cases in any way instilled in you a degree of hope that perhaps a cure for MND is not so far away? I, th I think it's important to to realise that, that this is a varied, a varied disease and uh, different people have very different trajectories. Mm. Um, when we say the average person can expect to live two to five years with this illness, that's true. Um, but there are certainly a, a significant number of people who live much longer. And they just have a, a slower form of the condition. At the moment, we have only one drug to slow this disease down. That's Riluzole. The other things that, um, that are offered to people with this condition, like uh, nutritional support, these are all things that have been shown to help manage this disease better and, and improve quality of life and, to some extent, improve survival. The girls had finished school that day for the year. And, um, you know, sometimes they'd been a bit Oh, I've got to go and play, Daddy can't spend time with you. But that night, before they went to bed, they said, Mum, can you lift me up? Both of them, one at a time. And they lay on top of him and gave him a cuddle and said how much they loved him. And they hadn't done that for some time. And it was almost like a power greater than ourselves was just putting everything in place, giving them a chance to do that, giving him a chance to say, to feel them on his body and to say goodbye to them. And then they went off to bed and over the hall and uh, he, his body was breaking down very quickly. And then when his heart did stop, I was glad for him. I was glad that he was free from the disease, but I just sat and talked with him and talked about our life together and um, talked about our stories. Looking to the future, we, we've got a disease here at the moment for which there is no known cause, no treatment, and no cure. How optimistic are you that that situation will eventually change? If we have the capacity to do the research that we want to do, I'm very optimistic. The, the more time, the more effort we put into understanding the causes and testing potential therapies, the, the better the chances are that we will actually be able to uh, treat this disease one day. Although the number of Australians diagnosed with motor neurone disease each year is significantly lower than for other terminal illnesses, it is, as we've seen, a devastating physical and emotional journey, both for the sufferer and the carer. Today, the relentless pursuit by the medical profession to discover the cause, a better treatment, and ultimately a cure for MND, continues through a broad range of research programs for which much more funding is desperately needed. If you're able to assist with a donation, however small, please go to one of these websites. <laughs>